So at this time, Joe Young will introduce our program. Thank you, President Tyler and fellow Rotarians. It's, it's my honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker today, Kevin Blair. Kevin is the President and Chief Operating Officer of Synovus. He has 25 years of experience in banking. He joined Synovus in August of 2016, replacing uh, Tommy Prescott as the CFO upon Tommy's retirement. Um, he's brought tremendous energy to the company and to the community. His, his leadership is, was immediately recognized and he's you know, been promoted to you know, chief, uh, chief operating officer and then later um, president. Uh, we're, we're proud to have him in the company and I'm, I'm proud to, to work with the company under his leadership. He's been a tremendous leader within the community as well. Uh, one of the things that he's, he's done is uh, this past year, he was the campaign chairman for the United Way and uh, set a record for fundraising, uh, over $7 million uh, committed and pledged uh, to the United Way. So we're so thankful for that. Uh, Kevin is, is married to Samantha. Uh, they have children, Cora and Carter, uh, that attend Brookstone School. Kevin, we're so glad to have you in the community. Uh, glad to have you speak to our club today. Guys, if you'll remember, if you have questions for Kevin uh, throughout his presentation, if you will just leave those questions in the comment section of the Facebook feed. Uh, with no further ado, here's Kevin Blair. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for that introduction. I'm, it's wonderful to be with you this afternoon, Rotarians, albeit virtually. Uh, I want to thank Haley and Tyler for their invitation to present today's program. I don't suppose there's anything I can say that hasn't already been said around the levity of this no longer novel way of meeting via Zoom or WebEx or any sort of virtual format. But by now, we've all become accustomed to hearing the non-muted mics, the barking dogs, the crying babies, the flushing toilets, and other quirks that I've heard over the last 90 days. Uh, but it's just some of the trade-offs that come with this new territory and environment that we're in. Uh, just for the record, in case you were wondering, this is the very first keynote address I've delivered in shorts. Uh, although I would be happy to put on some long pants and make the trip down to the convention center to get uh, Chef Walter's lunch. So I'll take you up when you when you have me come back for a in-person discussion. I hope everyone on the line today knows who Synovus is, and I hope that we're helping you in navigating through your financial needs and goals, especially during these uncertain times. And if not, we would be happy to do so. We're a $51 billion bank headquartered here in Columbus, Georgia. That ranks us 47th amongst all the banks in the US. And we're the only bank in that top 40 or top 50, excuse me, that is not headquartered in a major MSA. We take pride in that. We also take pride in our 130 year heritage here in the Chattahoochee Valley and now the five state footprint in which we serve. We believe that we remain uniquely positioned to be able to be a bank that is large enough to provide all the capabilities that the large banks provide, but we remain grounded uh, and we act like the small institutions in that we provide personal and customized service and advice. I wanna to begin today right up front by acknowledging the anguish surrounding the racial divide that we have in our country uh, and my desire and our company's desire for equality for all all of us here at Synovus and everyone uh, that, that I interact with believes that justice must prevail. We always uh, and will continue to honor and recognize the dignity and the worth of every individual and our treatment of those inside and outside our workplace will continue to be guided by those people first qualities and beliefs that Synovus has been known for for many, many years. We also know that words have to be matched with action. And so we're committed to accelerating our progress in inclusion and diversity initiatives. Uh, we need to have more frequent and more meaningful and deeper dialogue throughout our company. And we need to invest in efforts to specifically address racism, injustice, and inequality. Uh, Haley and Tyler's invitation came to me on March 10th. Uh, and in retrospect, that was a pretty interesting day because I think that was the last day and maybe the, the only a day that will be a normal day that we have for the remaining part of 2020. On that day, um, um, the next, I should say the next day on March 11th, President Trump delivered his short primetime address. 
uh, to the U.S. population talking about COVID. That same day, the NBA canceled the rest of their season, and Tom Hanks announced that he had contracted the COVID disease. On the following day, it became apparent that the spread of COVID was here to stay. Uh, it was the last day that um, we had most of our Synovus team members that were non-branch team members in the office, and the NCAA canceled their March Madness tournament on that same day. The following day on March 13th, the president declared a national emergency retroactive back to March 1st, and Augusta National right here in the state of Georgia announced it would postpone this year's Masters tournament to the fall. All of the Synovus Banking Centers converted that following Friday on March 20th to drive through an appointment only, which means as of today, we've had approximately 90 days since our, our pre-shutdown and the business as usual for our 300 branch locations. I guess you can say time flies when you're having fun or working at home, I'm not sure which one, but more than 80% of our 5,400 team members have been working remotely since the uh, COVID lockdown began. As president and chief operating officer, I'm pleased with the level of service that we've continued to provide our customers during this remote work setting. And actually we've seen our customer service scores increase during this time, which is really a testament to our hardworking team members across our footprint. Um, but we've also been able to manage several major projects that required a high level of teamwork and collaboration, which as everybody knows is more difficult with this dispersed workforce that we're all dealing with, including a very inspirational launch of the Paycheck Protection Program that I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going through today. Uh, last week, we began informing our team members that we do have return to work plans. Uh, currently, as of today's date, we are planning to have our branches reopen, our lobbies, I should say, uh, and many of our corporate offices begin to reopen in the month of July. But things are going to be a little different. Um, they're not going to be the way they were 90 days ago. In our branches, we're going to have greeters to ensure that we manage the occupancy and the lines, the social distancing, and we'll make sure that our team members are wearing masks. And although we're not gonna require that customers wear masks, uh, we are gonna recommend it. We've also developed cleaning and sanitation protocols for our branches and our offices that we'll continue to refine. And of course, we'll monitor and adhere to all the guidelines and recommendations from the local health authorities and officials. All of this to say that this will change and we know it will change and it may change before we open and we know it'll change after we reopen. There's an axiom that I use quite frankly a lot in business that you can't manage what you can't measure. And throughout my banking career, both in the financial and line of business side, I've been hyper-focused on numbers because I believe numbers tell the story better than rhetoric. So today I'm gonna to share a few numbers with you from Synovus, from the financial markets, from the economy that will help you to understand what's gone on over the last 90 days, but quite frankly, what we can expect in the current and in the future. To introduce the first number, I wanna mention that Synovus, at Synovus, we call our community outreach program, Here Matters. I like the name Here Matters because it doesn't need a lot of explanation. The words speak for themselves. It's the distillation of why we exist. We exist to serve our people, our team members, and our communities. Unfortunately, one of the casualties of social distancing has been that our in-person, hands-on approach that we usually take towards community service uh, through the Here, Here Matters program has been thwarted. So we've done everything we can to support the needs of our footprint and our community here in the Chattahoochee Valley, including matching contributions to the Red Cross, financial support for Feeding America. Um, and here's the first number. We provided close to 5,000 meals for frontline healthcare workers, custodial support, and first responders. Team members have also taken it upon themselves here at Synovus to write letters and cards to patients and physicians. We've also had people cut and sew face masks and even bake cupcakes and other pastries for healthcare providers. I'm not gonna try to convince everybody here today that those are, that those are heroic or those are world changing, but I did wanna mention it first because I think it demonstrates something important about Synovus and also about Columbus. Everything we know about being the bank of here, we've learned in this uh, locality. Uh, it's our hometown and it's taught us to serve one another, not because of an official obligation or contractual uh, relationship, 
but because we're citizens amongst friends and amongst neighbors, and we work together for a common purpose, not unlike the purpose of the Rotary Club of Columbus. Now, the next number I wanna share with you is a result of social distancing. Uh, first, uh, the enrollment in MySynovus, which is our mobile and online digital portal. Uh, that enrollment number has increased 20% since the fourth quarter of 2019. Now, that's a very large jump, jump in 90 days. That's a percentage that we typically see on a year-over-year -year basis, but not on a quarter-over-quarter -quarter basis. And while we rolled out substantial improvements to our version of MySynovus, the fact that it now has a 4.7 rating on the Apple Store, we're very pleased with. But that's not the reason why we've seen the increase in the enrollment. We know it's been due to the COVID-mandated social distancing that's driven most of the growth and the customer enrollment and, quite frankly, the adoption. At the same time, the lockdowns and the social network distancing has resulted in a fairly significant decline in our ATM and our traditional branch channel transactions. ATM transactions have declined 10% since the, the month of February, and branch transactions are off more than 20%. Last month, as we began to see things reopen, we did see ATM transactions return to a level of normalcy, but our branch transactions still remain fit well below what we saw uh, on historical levels. So social distancing and COVID uh, drove the increases in the online banking activity and the declines in the traditional volumes. But what's interesting is as we've seen a return to these conventional transactions, we've not seen a resulting decline in some of the digital transactions. Yeah, this adoption has been underway for some time, but we know that this healthcare crisis has helped to serve as a catalyst for more rapid expansion and growth and a permanent change for use in digital. Uh, the growth in our online banking uh, not only helps to validate the investments we've made in that platform, but it helps to validate all the technological investments we're making in our products and our services. The latest, in fact, is just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we developed in-house a way to have an online account origination tool for CDs. This is the first time at Synovus that you'll be able to whether you're a customer or not, uh, without setting foot in, in a Synovus branch. Uh, we've also invested in a lot of infrastructure and system improvements that we felt were necessary, uh, but not visible to most of our customers. And that's important because while technology is not necessarily our competitive advantage, to put it in contrast, uh, the four largest banks in the United States spend over $10 billion a year just on technology each. Uh, it is essential for us to enhance and improve the way in which we serve our customers. And ultimately, as a relationship bank, that serves as our competitive advantage. But it is important to note that our way to be able to compete with those banks that spend $10 billion is to leverage the best fintechs we can find to allow us to compete while not spending it nowhere near the level that the larger institutions are. And that brings me to the next number that I want to bring your attention to. We are really proud of these two numbers, 18,883 and $3 billion. That's the total number and the value of the Paycheck Protection Program loans that Synovus has made. And to refresh your memory, the Paycheck Protection Program, I'll refer to that as P3, it was part of the CARES Act that was authorized by Congress. It authorized $659 billion of loans through the SBA's 7A program for job retention and related expense, expenses for small businesses, not-for-profit organizations, and veteran-run organizations. These P3 loans made by Synovus directly supported businesses and organizations with employees of greater than 335,000. That means that we were able to ensure that those individuals went to work and received a paycheck, and that's across our five-state footprint. 70% of these loans were made were less than dollars which means it's really getting to the intended beneficiaries, which are our small businesses, and 35% were less than $25,000. Right here in the Chattahoochee Valley, we made over 1,500 loans, totaling over $200 million, averaging right around $135,000 per loan. Now, that's a, a feat in and of itself, but we know that the real value in this P3 program is the forgiveness. The government has said if you use the funds to pay uh, payroll 60% of the time and 40% of the time you can use it for things like interest, uh, insurance, and other things, that they will forgive the entire loan. So in essence, it becomes a grant. 
So we will begin as an institution to begin receiving forgiveness applications as soon as the forms have been finalized. And I think I saw an email come across my desk earlier today that the forms are almost done. Uh, and our process will be completely online. We're not certain how many or how much of the, the loans that we've made will be forgiven, but we're quite sure based on the enactment of the P3 Flexibility Act this past week, that most of our customers will be eligible for full forgiveness, depending on their records and calculations. So we're eager to start receiving those applications this month, and we'll have a full rollout in early in July. Now here's another P3 related number, 600. That's how many team members were directly involved with the, three, with the P3 program here at Synovus. March 28th, the day after the CARES Act was signed, uh, our team stood up an online expression of interest. One week later, uh, with the official la launch of the P3 program on April 3rd, we began accepting applications. The P3 application process was much more labor intensive than most people understood, and it required extensive documentation and for others to build the process that had never been built before. And without a lot of help and precedent and very little guidance from the SBA, our team built their own in-house P3 program and processing system in less than a week. For the first, uh, or I'm sorry, for the first six weeks of the program, stopping only on Easter Sunday, we had 600 plus Sonovus team members that worked around the clock. We had shifts going uh, both during the day and during the night, communicating with customers early and often to ensure that we delivered the funds that they so necessarily are so ne necessarily needed uh, uh, during this process. There were no customers who applied at Synovus who went through the process who did not receive funding, and we picked up 2,000 new customers along the way. As I mentioned a moment ago, the efforts of the P3 team were made possible by some of the more recent technology investments that we made in non-critical critical customer facing technology and infrastructure and supported by members of our tech team who ensured that there was always uptime and reliability. The dedication of our entire team, especially considering the constraints that have been imposed on us from this COVID environment, is a genuine demonstration of our Synovus effort and our relationship-based approach, and more importantly, our commitment to our customers and to our communities. I've never been prouder as a banker to see the value in which we can provide to help our customers. And I'm very proud to be part of this team who worked tirelessly to ensure that that happened. Now, you may be wondering, are there more things coming that are gonna help these companies? In fact, there are. The CARES Act also provided for another program called Main Street Lending. And the Federal Reserve will appropriate approximately $500 billion through the banks that will allow us to make loans to companies that have employees up to 15,000 employees uh, and revenues less than $5 billion. The Fed has continuously updated this program and we're very close to rolling this out at Synovus. You're gonna hear more about it in the coming weeks, but the, to know that this will be another program that Synovus will uh, uh, adjudicate that will allow us to provide needed funding to our customers through this, this federal uh, lending program. The overall cost of the CARES Act, which includes both the PPP uh, as well as this Main Street Lending Program is $1.7 trillion. So my next numbers that I wanna talk about is to put this $1.7 trillion in perspective. How much is that? And how do you compare that to other efforts? It's more than twice the $830 billion uh, that were put into place back in 2009 during the global recession. It's also two and a half times the, two, the $676 billion congressional authorized defense spending budget in 2019. It's nearly half the $3.5 trillion in revenues that the federal government receives every year from tax revenues. It's more than two times the amount um, that the GDP grew in 2019, and it's equivalent to about 8 percent of our total GDP, and it represents 40 percent of the U.S. money supply. Now, that's a mouthful, but simply said, $1.7 trillion is a lot. But the most important question, though, is it enough? And my answer at this point is, I'm not sure yet. Last week, the Business Cycle Dating uh, Committee of the National Bureau of Economic Research, which officially determines the beginning and, and the end of expansions and contractions, announced the previous economic expansion ended in February at 128 months, 
which is the longest in history, surpassing the prior record, which was 120 months. Now, they issued a statement last week, which I want to read, and then I'll comment on. The pandemic and the public health response have resulted in a downturn with different characteristics and dynamics than any prior recession. Nonetheless, the unprecedented magnitude of the decline in the employment and production and its broad reach of the entire economy warrants the designation of this episode as a recession, even if it turns out to be briefer than earlier contractions. Now, there are two lines in that announcement that got my attention. The first was unprecedented decline in employment and production, almost like the Book of World Records declaring something. When the NBER makes a comment like that, you have to know it means something. These numbers are all too grimly familiar with us today, but 20.9 million people unemployed as of June 11th and 13.3% jobless rate as of June 5th and consumer spending down 14%. This is the first time in the history of the U.S. economy that we've seen this significant of a change in our economic uh, metrics and numbers and unemployment. The other line that I, I took note of in the NBER statement was, even if this turns out to be briefer than earlier contractions. Now, just to be clear, that's not economist speak for a V-shaped recovery, and I don't have particular insights into what that true meaning was, but I do think it's interesting and possibly revealing that this organization believes that this business cycle determination last week possibly could be much shorter than the normal recession. Now, we all hope it is, and it appears that policymakers are on board with doing whatever it takes to get the economy back on its feet. Uh, last week, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said, I definitely think we're going to need another bipartisan legislation to put more money into the economy. Just two days ago, the Federal Reserve said it will start buying individual corporate bonds as part of a continuing effort to support market functioning and the ease of credit conditions. And moreover, just yesterday, the White House Trade Advisor, Peter Navarro, announced that President Trump is looking at at least another $2 trillion in coronavirus relief funding, reiterating interest in uh, enacting a payroll tax cut, as well as manufacturing incentives to return U.S. jobs back to U.S. soil. Now, the Federal Reserve has also helped with six interest rate cuts that occurred earlier this year. Uh, that puts the benchmark rate back at 0%. And the FOMC signaled last week that they would keep that benchmark interest rate at 0% at least to 2022. Jerome Powell actually said this past week, we're not even thinking about raising rates. 0% rates are not good for banks, I'll tell you that. But it is highly constructive for driving business activity and investment. We've been there before uh, from 2000, uh, December 2008 to December 2015. And we know how to manage through it while supporting customers and communities and our shareholders. But this recession, as I said earlier, is not like the earlier ones. This did not start as a financial crisis, but rather a healthcare crisis. Banks are, however, very well capitalized, and the safety and soundness of the banking system has never been stronger. To be a banker, or quite frankly, to be a business person of any form, is to operate from a basic level of optimism and confidence about growth, about the company's potential, about the country's potential, and about the future. In this country, in this community, uh, we're all grounded by our experiences. And maybe we haven't been right exactly here before, locked down at home with cover your eyes economic indicators, but we've been close to here. And we'll, we got through the previous recessions and the tough times, and we'll get through this one as well. Now, my optimism is not just uh, based on hope, it's also data supported. We just saw in May that retail sales were up 18%, higher than consensus by 8%. Year over retail sales are down, but uh, when you look at it based on the geography, the markets in the Southeast and predominantly Atlanta, uh, the lowest decline in year over year retail sales of any MSA in the country. So there's reason for optimism here in the Southeast. There are also industries that continue to thrive during this environment. Uh, we've seen grocery store sales increase, delivery services, home improvement, online retail, furniture stores, and as my credit card reflects, liquor sales. And even the industries that have suffered the greatest are starting to see reasons for optimism. Last week, when we look at the data from Open Table, there was a 66% increase in the number of reservations at restaurants around the United States. Our team and this community have faced a lot 
and there's a lot of work ahead of us. From the jolt of the global pandemic to the current unrest that our nation responds to with outrage and exhaustion over senseless deaths and, and the resulting riots that continue to plague, plague our nation. I'm hurting, our team members are hurting, and quite frankly, I think our community's hurting. But we're equally inspired and encouraged by the passion by which many have constructively responded. The words and the actions from our leaders across our community remind me uh, why this is a truly special place to work and live. I'm also filled with hope. My personal, as well as Synovus's longtime belief in the value and the worth of every individual will not carry us through, but it will continue to shape our response and compel us to lead change where we all live and work. I have a saying that I use often in the bank, the bank we want to be is the bank that we've always been, only better. The world is changing, our competition is changing, technology is evolving, and our customers continue to demand more. And as Columbus's bank of here, we are proud to stand by and with this community, and we're committed to improve, uh, to provide the value and the convenience that our customers deserve. So I, again, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak with you today. And I think there may be a little bit of time for questions. So I'm gonna stop there and turn it back over to Joe. Or maybe Cameron. Thank you, Cameron. Yeah, hey, Kevin. <laughs> thank you for that uh, presentation. Those those numbers are, uh, are, are quite interesting and in some cases um, a, a little staggering, uh, but it's, we, we're proud to have a bank like Synovus here in our community. We have seen the impact it's had on our local economy, on our nonprofit community. Um, and uh, Synovus has always been a, a major leader in, in our community. And we're glad that you're here and, and part of that team as well. Um, we do have just a minute uh, for, uh, for some questions. And one thing I wanted to point out first, and I'm gonna look at my other screen for a minute to read this because I think it was an interesting comment for anybody not looking at the uh, comment feed, Frank Shepard pointed out that the, uh, the P3 loan allowed the Feeding the Valley to remain at full strength to help us distribute over 4 million pounds of food to those in need uh, during this, this crisis. I think that's a, a, wonderful, a wonderful thing about that program. Um, one, one question for you, Kevin, is how, how might the maybe the work from home uh, concept during this pandemic become a permanent part of the Synovus culture? It, it's a great question, Cameron. We debate it every day. We, as I said earlier, we've learned a lot of lessons for how to be productive without having to have people in a physical location. So as we look at our reentry program, there'll be certain positions that we'll pilot to remain in a remote work capability. Uh, we believe that in many of our larger cities that we have, it sometimes takes an hour to commute to work. And if we can give that team member back their two hours of going to work and back to work, we're going to benefit as an organization by getting uh, more productive work time. We also acknowledge that that means that uh, when we bring people back, we need to make sure that we provide social distancing. And so as we look at our buildings and the uh, the, the way in which we've condensed workspace. It may mean for us that we have to have people rotate days and come back on, at different times so that we continue to allow people to have proper social distancing. But that's that's allowing us to be more collaborative in how we work. Uh, I think it's making us a better organization and it's making us think about how to be more efficient. The long-term answer I think is means that uh, banks like Synovus will take up less real estate. Uh, we're not gonna have as many uh, buildings in large cities with signs at the top of it because we'll be able to do it more efficiently. But what will not change is our need to work together and to make sure that we're making constructive changes to our processes and how we do things. And some we've had to learn during this last 90 days on how to do that without getting together in a conference room and everybody whiteboarding on a, on a, on a board uh, how to fix something. But uh, there's a lot to, to be... Um, uh, decided into the future, but we know this will change our organization permanently. Um, as a follow-up to that, has, has Sonova seen a significant uptick in the uh, uh, customer's use of the digital banking, uh, the mobile app and other digital banking services that don't require them to enter branches? And are those services going to continue to expand as a result of this? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> as part of our reprioritization of our capital expenditures, 
we took a lot of money that we had uh, designated for other things and we moved it into digital. We're moving most of the spend that we'll have the rest of this year into digital applications. You'll see more online account origination capabilities come on uh, line. And then in early next year, we're gonna roll out our commercial digital portal, which will allow our commercial customers to have a better mobile and online experience from what we provide today. So a lot of, lot of focus on that. And we recognize that our customers desire that in this sort of environment, but quite frankly, when we get to the other side of, of this uh, healthcare crisis. Excellent. Well, Kevin, thank you again for your time and for, and for your leadership. Uh, Tyler, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Cameron. And Kevin, thank you for, uh, for visiting with us today. Uh, we appreciate your time. Um, the work y'all have done in response to this crisis is really impressive. So thank you and, and thank you for your to your team. Um, as a recognition um, of your time with us today, um, we are going to donate a children's book to the Columbus Public Library inscribed with your name. So thank you again. I want to thank, um, thank everybody here that's watching with us today uh, for keeping Rotary on your calendar. Um, next week, our speaker will be Tiffany Wilson. Tiffany is the CEO of the Global Center for Medical Innovation. This is an organization based out of Atlanta that has done some really incredible work uh, just recently on helping um, to, to help the design and manufacture of uh, PPE and direct response to the coronavirus crisis. Um, this organization takes um, ideas largely from academia, works with research organizations, and helps commercialize those. Um, and, and in fact, uh, last week we heard from the AFLAC president, Fred Crawford. AFLAC donated $2 million to this organization for this cause. So join us next week. Um, and until then, um, our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>